Hi class, so with this lecture we're just going to do a brief overview of uh, just some basics of academic writing and APA. I know uh, that those are the things that give us the most trouble, you know, regardless of what class we're in, what subject matter we're looking at, you know, academic writing and APA kind of always give us problems and you know, even on the instructor level, guys, you know, there are, we still always have to keep working on these things, too. So, in my 10 plus years of teaching, I have, uh, I, I've got, uh, I think, just some basic little formulas to share with you guys that that'll really help make, you know, the, the APA and the writing part of your classes uh, a little bit easier easier to deal with so then it you know allows you more time to develop your voice and your critical analysis because when it comes to academic writing our voices are what's most important we've done all the research we've gathered all our sources we've got all our data you know we've read everything so it's all in our head marinating around bouncing around in there and when it comes to our assignment we've just got to get it out and write it all out right my best suggestion is always to keep it basic and simple you know and and that's you know even down to the fundamental like syntax of your sentences i'd rather see a sentence that says the dog ran which is a perfectly grammatical sentence, you know, that's grammatically correct, rather than a sentence that's like, the dog that was brown and tan, comma, and is uh, running down the road, you know, semicolon, chasing after a dog, you know, none of that is grammatically correct, not proper use of punctuations. And sometimes we get lost in that because we want to try to write those long sentences out. And when we can write them in short, shorter sentences, right? always try to think of writing short sentences, you know, that's a good way to start. And then the more you get used to doing that, the, the, you, you'll find that over time it gets easier then to expand an idea out in a sentence. But, you know, always keep it basic and simple, you know, writing something, doing the APA, and they seem ticky and tricky and very, you know, just nitpicky, <laughs> I guess we could say. But there are reasons for it. And, you know, the more you keep it basic and simple, there are reasons for it. We'll get to that. But my point is, is, you know, the easier you can make it on yourself, the, the better than it's going to make you as a communicator and as a writer. And then, uh, it, you know, that then helps your critical analysis skills. So then you give your, your brain that more time and space for developing your ideas and interpreting whatever your topic or your subject matter is, okay? So when it comes to academic writing, there is a basic essay format that you can follow. It doesn't matter what you're writing guys if it's called a case study if it's called a descriptive essay an argumentative essay if uh, the assignment says have these different sections in it it all starts with this basic five paragraph essay and then you know if when you you start with this basic essay of uh, five paragraphs then uh, it makes it easier than to uh, you know fit that into the parameters of what your instructor or, or you know that inside assignment is asking you to do okay so five paragraphs you always want an introduction you always want body paragraphs and you always want a conclusion you know ba at the basic level we always want to do three body paragraphs but like I said you know depending on uh, the more you advance in your academic and educational journeys you'll see that those body paragraphs they kind of get expanded out so instead of like three you'll have maybe like eight paragraphs or you know don't 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 worry so much about that like i said you know focus on uh the, this this basic uh format right here okay and then uh real quick you always actually want to think of it as uh so basically five paragraphs is a roughly five page essay you know most most classes you're going to do like three to five pages until you get to that big one at the end for, for most assignments especially in my classes we do like three to five pages right guys 
And so uh, you always then want to think of it as seven because you always want to include that title page and you always want to have that reference page at the end and that reference page can turn into multiple pages to port depending on your sources. But you know, when you, once again, keep that basic formula in mind. I do think it helps then to change or you know, to fit it into the parameters of what you're being asked to write about. And you know, like I said, it kind of helps take some of that stress off of that okay so when it comes to that introduction that is where you'll state your thesis your thesis is going to be your main argument it's going to be that main focus that main topic of your paper it's you know the purpose of your paper it's you know this paper is about the purpose of this paper is to discuss forward and psychoanalysis the purpose of this paper is to discuss the main battles of World War II, you know, any any phrasing like that, the purpose of this paper, this paper will be about my topic I'm going to explore, you know, something that it, it indicates, you know, like once again, what that topic of the paper is. Okay, now here's where I think a lot of us get a little off track and confused. That introduction is the overview of your paper and the main points of that paper, all right? So I said, uh, I'll write a paper on forward and psychoanalysis. A main point would be defense mechanisms, um, say dream analysis, uh, 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 his uh, psychosexual stages of development. So those would be my three main things that I'm going to talk about when I talk about Sigmund Freud and uh, his, his uh, psychological theory there of psychoanalysis, right? All right, now, uh, how am I accurately going to talk about what my paper is about, summarize it, if I haven't written it out yet? Now, I know I'm going to have those points. I know what my thesis is, but I don't have that substance. I don't have the bulk of the paper to be able to adequately put all that together in a coherent way that, that you know, fully summarizes what my paper is about right and so along those lines you know it, it's kind of think of it this way how can you provide an overview of a paper that you haven't written yet that's the way I like to think of the introduction I like to you know I get that thesis I figure out a couple few main points that I'm going to write about for my body paragraphs and then I start in the middle and I write those body paragraphs and, and in doing that it just seems like you naturally flow and come to that conclusion but when you start in the middle with those body paragraphs then you have it you have the bulk of your paper you know exactly what your paper is talking about it's fresh on your mind so it makes it easy then to go back and write out that little introductory paragraph where you're summarizing what it is about so hopefully that makes sense and then when it comes to that conclusion your conclusion is your introduction but it's kind of uh it's like the opposite okay uh maybe opposite's not the right word it's it's whereas in the introduction you're providing a summary and overview of what the paper is about and the conclusion you're you're just refreshing your reader so so you're providing that summary and overview again but it's in the context of this was what the paper was about, whereas the introduction is this is what my paper is going to be about. You see, it's kind of maybe a little tense uh, shift there in the writing. And uh, when it comes to that conclusion, you always want to restate whatever that thesis is. And it's a good rule of thumb to not, you know, don't just copy and paste your introduction and use that as a conclusion. You definitely you want to rewrite those sentences out differently. You know, use a, th a thesaurus and maybe try to find different words to use. You know, those are all good ways to help develop your voice and your critical analysis. And sometimes when it comes to those main points uh, uh, for those body paragraphs, a good rule of thumb is to use your assignment questions or, you know, you, the assignments are always gonna have some questions or bullet points on them of, of, you know, what exactly that assignment wants you to focus on. And you could take those and, uh, you know, rewrite my statements 
and use those as the main point of your paper. And then you want to always make sure that you have those in-text citations for all your facts and uh, as support for your facts and your points. And uh, we'll go over this in a minute, but uh, those in-text citations, they're kind of like the brief shorthand of that full source that you read. And so the reference page is where we put that full source of the information. So that's why it's always important with APA that we have in-text citations and a reference page. They're both kind of the same. They, they work together. That's a better way to say that. We'll get to that in just a second here. All right, so like I said, you know, it, it, uh, academic writing, APA, they really follow basic formulas. And when it comes to writing, asking yourself those questions of, you know, those, those basic questions, guys, who, why, what, when, who, why, what, when, where, and how, how many ever, five or six of them there. And, uh, you know, why is this information relevant? What does this information mean to my topic? How is this uh, uh, relevant to my topic? And, you know, why is it important for other people to know about this? You know, what does this mean for society? How does this relate to human evolution? I'm just kind of, you know, randomly throwing things out there. But as you're writing your paper, you know, you want to ask yourself those questions and, uh, you know, and, and have that kind of written out in your writing because, you know, that's how you go about making sure that you have all your points explained and you have all those points backed up with academic sources, okay? So I think that, you know, once again, if you, you know, just, just try to break it down to, to that basic formula there with your writing it makes it a lot more simple than to, to you know, I don't want to say simple or less stressful because you're still going to be stressed out about having to do your assignment, you know, especially depending on the time you pick. Some of us like to wait till the last minute, right guys? I'm kind of guilty of that at times. And, uh, and and so I think you know when you when you can keep that that basic out or uh, that 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 basic formula you know that that five page uh, par uh, essay paragraph structure that's what I was trying to say then once again you know once when you get to looking at that assignment and what it wants you to do if you start there it, it really does uh, make that process a little more simple and efficient that's a better way to say it instead of easier you know because it because then you have something to go along you don't really just have a blank screen and just these assignment questions you could start you know molding that into your blank screen and kind of writing stuff and and then you know you know exactly how you have it set up hopefully that all makes sense guys so when it comes to APA it always follows a simple formula too it doesn't matter what kind of source that you have read, what kind of source that you are citing. It's always when, when you go to write that source out and include it in your work, it's always going to follow this formula. Who wrote it? When did they write it? What is it? And where did you get it from? Okay. <coughs> Really, when it comes to your APA and your in-text citations, it shouldn't. You, you want to focus more on developing your critical analysis and your voice and your writing. So, in a way, they're kind of an afterthought. They're very important to include, though. I'll, I'll, and, I, and once again, I'll get to why that's important to include in a minute. But when you're writing, you don't want to bog yourself down with trying to do both. Focus on, like I said, you know, you've already read everything. You know where your sources are. You know, you know what they said. Focus on writing it out first. And then, you know, and, and make little notes of, okay, well, that's a fact. I'll need to, you know, make sure I cite it from that source. And, oh, I know I got it from this source here and whatever. And, you know, just, just, you know, focus on that critical analysis first. And then, you know, as you're editing it, you can make sure that your APA elements are formatted. Uh, uh, um, uh, correctly. So when it comes to in-text citations, the simple, simplest, easiest way to include those is simply have the author's last name and date at the end of your sentence. You know, when you write something, uh, and a good rule of thumb is to have at least one in-text citation per paragraph. Sometimes like 
in my history class, we were talking, well, you know, everything we're talking about is facts, and you would have to have a citation after every sentence, you know, that that's going to take away from what you're writing and what you're trying to say. Maybe you guys have read some of those journal articles where it's just, you know, you have like three words of the sentence, and then it's like two two lines of, of authors' names, and, and, you know, that's great. I mean, you know, once again, when we get to that level, you kind of have to expand things out. But start simple and, uh, you know, make sure you just have that name and date at the end. I'll show you some examples of how to do that, too. But that, it's such an easy way. Boom, there it is. Boom, you got one per paragraph, either at the beginning or at the end. And, uh, you know, you, you've hit that requirement. You know, sometimes the difference between an A paper and a B paper is simply because you don't have that support, you know. And it comes down to just that basic, this is a basic thing of academia that we, we want you to do. And uh, can you follow directions and get that done? And then, and then when we see, yes, indeed, you can. And, and that, that adds more than credibility and, and to your critical analysis. I hope that makes sense, guys. So when it comes to references, we're always going to follow that same formula. In fact, that's where we see this formula play out. And for the most part, what is going to change is where did you get your source from? All right, but it's always you're always going to write it out, no matter if it's a web page, if it's a journal article, encyclopedia podcast, a YouTube video, you're always going to have it set up as who wrote it. It's going to be the author's name first. It's going to be that date second. It's going to be whatever the name is of whatever that source is. And then it's going to be the information of where did you get it from. And that's what really uh, uh, gets played around and changes with the different sources. But it's all always going to be that formula, guys. All right, so APA, once again, I know in all your classes, all the classes I teach, we always talk about APA. And uh, the, the reason that we include APA is to note where we got our information from. And then the more importantly, it's a way to share information. So think of it this way. And think of it as you've come up with some wonderful new invention okay here we go you were the first person to uh, come up with the air conditioning or or come up with the inventing the microwave or maybe you came up with some wonderful new cake recipe you were the first person that made red velvet cake and and then you know it got popular and it goes out into society and everybody's oh this is such a great new cake who came up with this idea and nobody gives you credit for it oh the microwave what a great invention well who made that well, I don't know. And then what's worse, somebody else takes credit. Well, I did it. I'm the one that made that. They're like, no, you didn't. I did. That is basically what, what we are doing with our APA. We are saying that, yes, this is my interpretation of this subject, but I want to thank Dr. So-and-so over here for taking the time, the energy, and the effort to write this book out for me to read it and, and help you know expand my mind and make my brain smarter. That's basically what it is. It's a way to acknowledge the people and the researchers who who have already put their efforts in to writing this information to share with us. So we just want to make sure that we give them proper credit and acknowledge them for that. And once again, that's when it comes back to why we should keep our APA basic and simple. You know, just by having the last name and the date there at the end of a sentence, at least one per paragraph, it gives that proper credit where proper credit is due, okay? So when it comes to uh, trying to decide what we need to cite as far as what our, our um facts are in our writing. A general rule of thumb, names, dates, places, proper nouns, which are basically names, dates, and places. Those are all our proper nouns, right? Or anything specific to a source. So let's, we'll go back to my uh, Freud and psychoanalysis. So let's say I read one book that says something specific about 
defense mechanisms or, or something specific about Freud and uh, you know and I've read all these other sources and this is the only one that says that has that information and so in my interpretation of that and, and wanting to include that idea I want to make sure that I give that person who wrote that book credit and that's where the APA comes in and, and you know those in-text citations come in all right so 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 we've got those basic formulas and and really guys it, once again it just stays a basic formula you know when we you when we just think of our in-text citations as last name and date there, there, are, there are a few basic ways that we can go about including that information to give that proper credit and then, you know, to help uh, uh, support our critical analysis and uh, our points that we are making. So basically what I have here is just a few different ways that you could do that. You'll note that, uh, you, you'll note, you know, just the way I have those set up and structured, I, you know, and structured, excuse me. You see my first one there is my basic just last name and date boom and uh, when you guys you know in class if, if you notice when I do my discussions or anything that I write in class I, I very commonly do it like that because once again it's the easiest way to do it and then for me because I've already read everything and I've done the this is actually a history class and developmental psychology these author no wait they're both oh no wait yeah that is my developmental psychology so I write these out a lot so you know I've gotten to the point to where I know who I know who the author is I know what the date of that textbook is and it's really simple for me just to you know boom do that real quick and then of course it's a good example to help show show you guys how to include those elements but if you want to get a little fancy with it you want to help straight, uh, change up the structure and uh, syntax of your sentences. Like I said, there are a few basic ways that you can include citations. And, and you see, I have those noted there. And you notice, with those last two, I have more than one author. Okay, I have three authors. So I want to make sure that I always put all three of their names in those in-text citations when I make reference to that source. When it comes to four or more authors, that's when you use the ETAL that I'm sure most of you guys have, have at least noticed in your readings and research. And uh, yes, when you have four or more authors, and some some authors will end up having 12, 14, you know, because sometimes a lot of times you got you have to do collaborative type writings once you get up to uh, you know those high academia levels but my point is four more authors you do e you do first author's name ETAL after that I don't have an example of that sorry guys but you can go look up the Al Purdue website or just type in APA do a search APA examples uh, more than four authors and it'll give you you know you'll find some good sources on the web for that but uh, what I really want to note with that is that when you use that ETAL, it's always important that the first time, the first time you note that source in your work, you write everybody's names out in the citation. So, uh, so, 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 you know, take, take, keep that in mind. And then if you go to reference that source again later in your paper, say you have it up here in your first paragraph, three paragraphs later, you want to use that, that source with 12 authors again, you have to write them all back out again. It's within the paragraph that you do the ETAL. First time you write it all out, subsequent times you do the ETAL. Hopefully that makes sense there, guys. And, uh, oh, <coughs> Direct quotes. A lot of time from students I hear, well, when you do in-text citations, they think you have to have that paragraph number, that section number, that page number included in that too. That is a, that is for a specific type of in-text citations, and it is direct quotes. When you take something and you copy and paste it from one source, and put that in your paper that is considered a direct quote and you have to use quotation marks and then you have to oh oops this one's wrong sorry guys I did that let me fix that you have to use quotation marks on that oh, oops 
to note that that is from another source. Now, um, when it comes to academic writing, you always want to follow the 80-20 rule. Would you write in 80% your own words, no more than 20% cited sources. So I, I try to encourage students to stay away from those copy and paste it direct quotes and try to paraphrase more. And it's just that, guys. It's just taking that and writing it out in your own words. So uh, before I get into this, I'm, I'm going to stay on this. So look at that uh, sample three there that I have. That is a direct quote. Note how I have that written out. Note how I have that, that APA formatting for that in-text citation there. And then basically what I would do for my paper, you know, well... If you use direct quotes, use them very sparingly because once again, academic is academic writing is more about your ideas, your voice, and your critical analysis. You want those citations, you want those quotes to support you. So you don't want to have big parts of your paper where you have these copied and pasted sections. You want to have big parts of your paper that are your writing and then kind of that built around it as your structure. It's kind of, think of it as like a house. The, the, that support is kind of the bones of your house, you know. And, but, but, you know, it's that, that main bulk, the walls and the flooring and the piping and the roof and all of that stuff. That's the main bulk of the house, and that's your critical analysis. Okay, guys? <clears throat> So enough on that. Let's talk about what happens when we have websites with no authors and then websites with authors. Sometimes you'll come across a website and it won't have an identifiable author. That should throw up a red flag because if you can't find a name or if you you know if you can't answer that that basic formula who wrote it when was it written what is it where did you get it from as you're looking at sources online that more than likely means that it is not an academic source and it is not a source that you want to reference in your academic work. Wikipedia and the wiki sites are a good example of that. And those sites are good for kind of getting that basic information, you know, to go, say, say you don't know about Fourier psychoanalysis, go to Wikipedia, read up on it real quickly, and then go into your school's library and find those academic sources talking about them. You know, like use that Wikipedia as like a springboard just to help give you that basic foundation so when you go read those academic journals, it kind of makes a little more sense. But don't ever cite Wikipedia as a, you know, as, as, as a source source because it's not academic. Does that make sense, guys? I have students ask that. It'd be like, well, every website that I read about stuff and every book that I read, do I have to reference it? Not really, because once again, you know, sometimes we have to get, we have to build a foundation for what it is that we're going to write about, and so we will kind of like bounce around and look at various sources, and that is okay, and you don't have to put all it, it's not till you get to the PhD level that you have to put every single source that you use in your, uh, on your reference page and in your writing, but like I said, for the most part, sometimes we will go and look at some thing and then allow that to lead us into those more academic sources and and so you know we do use all of that information in our writing and once again when we know that we're always writing it out in our own words and our own syntaxes we don't have to worry so much about dipping into those realms of similarity and plagiarism like we do if we have a bunch of stuff that is copied and pasted into our papers what I like to do is if I find something that's a really good idea, I'll like take that and copy and paste it in my paper and then I just sit there and I rewrite it. You know, sometimes you have to go word by word and then sometimes it's a lot easier to, to rewrite that out. But you know, whatever you do to, to help you write that out in your own words and then uh, delete, delete the copied and pasted part from your paper and then, you know, once again, you just do that boom, name and date at the end of it and you're good to go, right? So be careful of websites that don't have authors on it. Now, of course, there's always an exception to the rule. Organizations, corporations, governmental agencies, uh, uh, um, like uh, school organizations, school websites, it's things like... Uh, 
wildlife agency, you know, different governmental type websites. Uh, I'm trying to, I can't, and NAACP organizations like that. Those are accredited, a uh, World Wildlife Fund. I'm trying to think of different ones, uh, you know, uh, the IRS. Those are all accredited websites, or and, and you know, so if you get information off of those, and you don't have authors for specific uh, articles or, or blog posts you would read on those types of websites, because we recognize them as official organizations, official corporations, we we you know take the faith that they are already providing us with accurate factual information and so it's okay to use the name of the website you use or the name of the website or the organization that is running that website so as you see in my examples I have the National Osteoporosis found uh, osteoporosis excuse me foundation so I went and obviously you know I'm reading about facts about osteoporosis on the osteoporosis foundation website and as I'm reading those facts I'm not seeing, you know, it says specifically Dr. Smith wrote this or, or whatever. It's just, it's it's their organization that wrote that. So once again, because they're accredited, they're recognized, I know it's okay to use. You know, different schools, I don't, uh, if you guys were in my classes, sometimes you'll see, I'll give you a, an example for a source, and it'll be like maybe from... Duke University or Kentucky University or the University of Alabama, you know, and it's because I know that those are, once again, that those are accredited bodies of, of information. That's a good way to call it organization. They're accredited bodies of information. So I know if I use them that it's okay that I just use their name and not a specific person. Does that make sense, guys? I hope that makes sense. And then what I have are just some, once again, different in-text citation examples of how to note that source and you know you guys will notice it's no different from the last slide I just showed you and those other sources you know we're still following those basic formulas the only thing that are that's changing here is the name and the date because we're using a different source but you see it's still the same formatting okay and then let's say that you're going through and you're looking at, uh, you're looking for multicultural workplace information. You find the California Job Journal. And on the California Job Journal website, you, you find this article and you see that it actually has an author. So that then is how you would set that reference up. And once again, guys, you see it doesn't change. We have the same pattern. We've got that same, we've got the formula. Who wrote it? Copeland. Who wrote it? Nastro Oste uh, Osteoporosis Foundation. When did they write it? What's that date, that year? We've got the year. What is it? It's, a, it's the Managing a Multicultural Workplace article. It's the Fast Facts article. Where did you get it from? That website from that URL address. So you see guys, that same formula is always there. It's just like I said, it's just, it looks different and it looks like it changes because you're just using the different names and dates and, and, and such. But you always, who wrote it? When did they write it? What is it? And where did you get it from? All right, and then just uh, on this slide, a couple of basic examples of how to set up sources. For the most part, when it comes to uh, uh, the sources and references that we get for our writing, you know, you're always going to use textbooks, you're always going to uh, use journal articles, and then uh, YouTube videos. We like to use a lot of uh, YouTube videos and reference those too, right guys? So these are the most common sources that students use and so I give you the example of how to set those up and once again guys none of these veer from that formula who wrote it when did they write it what is it where did you get it from that's all it's all laid out right there and then your job then is just to put in the specifics from that source for that formula you just plug it in for that formula right and like I said, when you look at these different sources, they seem like, oh gosh, they seem all so different because you see those different elements in them. It's still, but they're still name, 
date, what is it, where did you get it from? That's what you'll notice change. When you look at the end there, that's kind of the stuff that changes. And then sometimes how you note that name or how you note that date is going to change around a little bit. But the, it's always going to be the same formula. And so... Um, You'll see, you know, like I said, with the YouTube videos or like if you do TED Talks, you know, sometimes you'll have that screen name, sometimes you won't. It, it gets a little tricky, but once again, guys, just focus on the basic formula and then it makes it easier, like I said, to, to kind of change around those elements for your specific source that you are using there, okay? A lot of times when it comes to journal articles, you're going to notice that there are two different where did you get it from type information that you use at the end there. Sometimes you'll have journal articles and you'll see the, this weird little what we call a DOI number at the end of it. Maybe some of you guys who are like me, uh, 40s and above, you know the Dewey Decimal System. You remember going to the library and have to open the catalogs and and you had to know what number and then you had to go to the aisle and you match it up as to what book was it. You guys remember that? Some of you millennials, younger generation, you, you didn't have the joys of doing research that way because we have the online environment now so it makes it a lot easier to find articles and to find sources. Regardless though, we still have these specific classification systems when it comes to journals and articles that are those DOI. It's like the Dewey Decimal System. And, and that's just, it's, it's, you know, nothing really pertinent to what we're writing about. It's just that, that way that you note that where you got it from information. So I just point that out because I just want you guys to note the difference of if you have an article and you see that DOI of how you include that at the end for your where did you get it from formula as to compare to an article that won't have a DOI at the end and you see how you just set that up. And then with most journal articles, you see how I have the name of it, and then I've got those little numbers behind it. You, so, so that's just a little extra something you add in, but it's still what is it? And saying, what is it? You know, what's the name of it? It's this article from this journal, and it's just the specifics. It's saying it's, it's you know, New Ideas in Psychology, and it is the 28th volume, third issue of that. And my article that I am writing referencing is on those specific pages. Once again, it's just about sharing that information so when somebody else wants to go read that, and they can easily access it in that journal. And you notice down here in our example of our journal article without a DOI, we've still got those volumes, we still got that issue number, we still got the page numbers there. Sometimes you won't have all of those, like some journal articles it's just going to be volumes or it's just going to be issues and uh, that's okay then then the, then the, then you deduct if if uh, my new ideas in psychology there was just issues and that was issue number 3 i would just take that 28 out so so once again guys don't get caught up because you're kind of seeing these different elements just you know realize that it's always who wrote it when did they write it what is it and where did you get it from? It's always going to follow that formula. And then just once again, guys, just to help, uh, you know, point, uh, just to help give us more examples, here are those ways to include those citations. I've got an online textbook that I've got as an example this time. And once again, it doesn't matter that, that this is a different book from the one that I showed you three or four slides ago. It, it's not different from the one with the osteoporosis osteoporosis foundation I cannot say that word I've still got that same basic formula my in-text citations I have the name and I have the date if I want to do a quote then I have the name and I have the date and I actually show you a, a kind of a different way on how to set up that quote there with that second example and be there and then I show you to paraphrase so you see I copied and pasted it from the book the sand of the Kalahari desert or the oldest culture in the world that is directly from no and loud I did not write that no and loud wrote that okay so that is 
directly copied from them. Now I really do, once again, I don't really want to have a lot of direct quotes in my paper because I'm more focused on my voice and my critical analysis and my instructors want to see my voice and my critical analysis. So I'm going to take that sentence and I'm going to paraphrase it. I'm going to rewrite it in my own words. It's telling us that the oldest culture in the world is the sand who live on the Kalahari Desert. Right? And then I happen to know that the San are also called the Bushmen, so I add that little tidbit in for, uh, you know, just for uh, aesthetics, I guess you could say. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my point is, is that, you know, I paraphrase that. I took what I read there, and then I wrote it out in my own words. And I changed the sentence around. You know, you see, I still, I still, it's still the Kalahari Desert and the sand and the oldest culture in the world I'm talking about. And so I still have those specific words. But once again, guys, I changed that completely around. So the way I wrote it out is in my own voice and my own style compared to the way that those authors wrote it out. Does that, does that, um, that make sense, guys? And then, uh, because, you know, no matter which of my classes you guys are in, we always have those online textbooks. And so once again, basic formula there guys who wrote it uh, what's the date sorry who wrote it when did they write it what is it and where did you get it from APA has just recently done some new updates I know as you guys are familiar and some of you are emailing me and asking about and it's really simple guys the the only glaring things that have stood out to me with these updates which actually makes it easier for us is that um, when you have a textbook that you get online, you want to make sure that you add that publisher, that that's where did you get it from information. And so technically, you know, the online version came from the print version that came from this publisher. So now they just want it to acknowledge the publishers. If it's a website, now you just want to make sure you acknowledge that the website's name and then you do the retreat from. Some of you guys do that already. So uh, you were ahead of the 7th edition updates. <laughs> and then uh, the only other glaring thing I've noticed is that mostly uh, is that on our title pages uh, we used to have to put a running head at the top. You don't have to worry about having that run or he running head anymore. And once again, that's something most of us usually forget to do anyway. So it's it, it makes it easier on us instructors that we don't have to be like. Don't forget to include that. Now it's, it's like I don't have to worry about it anymore. None of us have to worry about it anymore. That's a great thing, okay? Those are really are the only glaring things that I have seen different. Um, there is a, you know, with paraphrasing, put the page number in there. But once again, guys, you know, pr practically everything you read is some way going to be paraphrased of something else. And, and when you know, keep it in your own words. Keep it in your own voice. Use plagiarism checkers to help keep that, uh, you know, to help to help make sure you have that 80-20 balance. You know, you, you're not going to have to worry then about similarity and plagiarism, okay? And so, once again, you know, I've, I've showed you guys a bunch of different examples. I've showed you the in-text and I've showed you the reference for those. That's another thing I want to point out. No matter how many times I have Novak and Lard, Laird, excuse me, noted in my paper in an in-text citation, and, and, and you know, no matter, no matter if I went to their book and I used just chapter one or chapter seven or, or chapter ten in there, I'm not going to have a different reference and go culture anthropology chapter one, culture anthropology chapter seven. You, it's all one reference. It all came from the same place. Sometimes we like to do that with websites. So let's say you're on history.com website and you're looking up stuff about World War II and so this this particular article on this page of the website is talking about um, the Battle of Stalingrad. And then you go to this particular page on the website and it's talking about uh, the Battle of Maine. Uh, right? On your reference page, you're not going to have that listed twice with both of those on there. They're both from history.com website, so you just want to do history.com website. You know, if it's if it has an author, that's the only way it's going to be different. But most of the time on history.com, they don't, and so you just put history.com editors. I'm okay with you guys doing that. that 
that's that's okay to do that or if you just want to put like history.com as your author you can do that too I hope I'm not confusing you throwing too much information out at one time my point is is that if it's one website it doesn't matter if the information is from different pages on the website it's still the same source so you only want to list that once on your references and like I said of course it gets ticky once you get authors and maybe different things but but for the most part and for most of our classes we're always going to keep those basic simple elements and then like I said you know when you when you get your brain trained to think of it that way it then makes it a little easier to include those different elements because when you already have this basic formula down you use that as your template and if you're seeing something different then that's when you could go and reference your APA manual or reference something like the Al Purdue's website to look at that specific type of source to see what it tells you and I think it makes it less confusing because you already have the basic formula there so you're just looking for for the differences you know you're just looking for okay well what did I not add or what needs to be taken out of my basic formula in fact nothing will ever be taken out of that basic formula we just kind of add to it with the different sources kind of like with the DOI and the not DOI there guys that's uh, you know so hopefully this all makes sense and is you know pretty simple and basic for you guys so like I said those APA updates I have that you should I think in the recording you should be able to uh, click on those if not I will have them down below in the little description here when I put this up on YouTube so you guys can go and uh, click those links and get to these sites to help you out with there since I had those in-text citations of uh, Diker and then Winton, Dunn, and Hammer uh, in my first examples I gave you guys, I just wanted to show you how to uh, break down and do those full sources on the reference page. And because, you know, you some of you guys are in my history class, that's how we cite our history book. Some of you guys are in my uh, developmental psychology class, that's how you would cite that. Sorry, some of my other classes I didn't get our sources in there, but you guys can always shoot me an email I'm more than happy to set up any source for you you know show you how to put it up in in, in, in this basic format you know show you how to do your in-text citations I, I'm more than uh, than happy to help you guys with that so please don't hesitate to reach out to me and then because I keep talking about uh, that 80-20 rule of originality and not wanting to dip into those realms of similarity, too much similarity, and then, you know, the worst case scenario, plagiarism, you know, that's when you're, you're, you're drowning is when you're in plagiarism, right? And we never, we never want to go past that, uh, past, past the uh, barriers to where we get sucked in by the undertow. That's kind of what plagiarism is there. It's that undertow that'll kill you, you know? It's the same with our writing, right? So, to help make that easy for you guys, it doesn't matter what class of mine you are in uh, for at least the next year. Um, if, if you go and, and try to use this class ID and this enrollment key and it doesn't work for you, just, just shoot me an email, guys, and I'll, I'll get you the correct information. But I do, as of right now, this is set up at least for the next year. So please feel free to use this access to turn it in, to check your work for I've got it set up where well, it'll check your writing, grammar, syntax punctuation your your you know whatever it takes everything in your writing and it also looks for a similarity slash plagiarism in your work so uh, it's it's a free access all you have to do set up your student account and then use that class ID and enrollment key and you'll see a folder I do believe it says check my draft in there but you can go in there guys I don't check that folder for anything unless unless the student specifically emails me with a question about their paper Paper. that's the only time I ever go and to turn it in other than when I use it to go run my own work through it but you know I never it's not like I if you guys turn stuff in I go and spy on you <laughs> I frankly don't have time for that guys but if you want me to look over your paper you want me to look over your writing please do reach out to me even even if class is already over guys don't hesitate to reach out to me I'm always here and I'm always uh, uh, available as a source to help you guys in your academic journey so like I said I've got that set up and uh, you know please 
please feel free to use that that is that's a free service that I'm giving you guys use it for whatever class you take like I said as long as you have access to it if you can't get access to it anymore shoot me a quick you know save my email address from class guys and just uh, shoot me a quick email and I will always be more than happy to to uh, reshare that because like ever so often it does like cut out and I have to go and and redo it so it's a different ID and different enrollment key and uh, so so like I said shoot me an email anything that you guys would need guys to shoot me an email I am here for you for everything you need everybody's doing great and whatever class you're in right now believe me when I tell you that you are doing awesome I appreciate you I've got some great classes going right now great students individuals in those classes you guys are all stellar and fabulous and so uh, keep striving for excellence and like I said guys if you need me please do not hesitate to reach out to me for anything so all right thanks guys see you in our discussions bye